Small business is about courage, risk-taking, independence, and we small business owners are survivors. Everybody has an idea for a business, but how do you take that idea from mind to market? This is the place to learn. Small Business School with Hattie Bryant. It's a new kind of school. Together we'll learn about business from the inside out, from the people who've done it. We'll meet the men and women who are today's pioneers and quiet heroes. Their lives are the textbooks. Our classroom is the world. Small Business School is made possible by support from the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. And by Microsoft. We see you building a new company from an old company. We see a business full of potential. We are inspired to create software that helps you reach it. Hi, I'm Hattie Bryant. We believe there should be at least a half hour per week on television dedicated to tell the stories about people who create wealth and work and make the world a better place. Today we visit with a legend who encourages us to create our own legend. Meet an old friend, Fess Parker. You may remember him as Daniel Boone or Davy Crockett. Last year, over 60,000 people visited the Fess Parker Winery and Vineyard, located 32 miles north of Santa Barbara on the Foxen Canyon Wine Trail. You like that one? Mm, yeah. In 1987, Fess Parker and his son Eli purchased 714 acres. Eli enrolled in viticultural classes, and this business was born. While Eli focused on the winemaking, his dad concentrated on building the winery and visitor center. Total sales reached $5 million last year. So he really is 6'6". Six, six. You can tell. I come up to his elbow. <laughs> you probably remember Fess Parker when he looked like this. On television in the 50s, he was Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. And from 1964 to 1970, he played the role of Daniel Boone. Here we go. Now, Fess Parker tells us about new adventures in a different frontier. The only problem is I'm going to want to drink it. That's OK. Oh, OK. <laughs> no, please do. Thank you, thank you. I'm planning about 100 acres of this. By the way, for your own personal. personal. <laughs> yeah, for my own personal consumption. <laughs> When you left acting and when you decided, okay, I don't want to do that anymore, why did you go into real estate? How did you get it started? Roll back the clock and tell us about that. I think two, two factors. One, my father always, like most Texans, I really put a high premium on real estate. Mm -hmm. uh, the landed people were the successful people. <clears throat> uh, the second factor was Walt Disney. I was under personal contract to him when he was preparing to open Disneyland. So I met many of the people involved in that massive uh, project and I understood then that they existed and how they, why they existed, where they fit into the equation. And when I decided to leave uh, the film business, uh, the land seemed to be the natural place and it also had an, a, an opportunity for a person to be creative, uh, which I felt good about. So did you save up some money to be able to buy your first piece of land? How'd you get the first piece? Uh, there's a man uh, whose name is Al Schneider in Louisville, Kentucky, and I met him along the way. And uh, I drove around Louisville with him one day, and he was a developer. And he pointed out an office building, and he said, I own that, but I don't have any money in it. And then he said, I, I built this and I own that, but I don't have any money. And I said, well, how do you do that? And he said, that's called leverage. So with that understanding and uh, using some of my acting ability. <laughs> <laughs> Smoke and mirrors? Smoke and mirrors. mirrors. I, per yeah. I persuaded some uh, people to uh, finance projects. Okay. And I still remember uh, uh, my first significant project was a partnership with uh, three other gentlemen, and we went down to the bank and borrowed a million dollars. And I thought, it's wonderful. Wow. 
They're going to yeah. give us a million dollars. Yeah. In the real estate development segment of, the, of your life, how much would you say was failure and how much was you, would you say is success? I mean, you could say, oh, that was a bad decision. I shouldn't have let it go, but I did this, 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 and this. The whole thing uh, is that I came along at a time in California when almost anything that was reasonably put together was likely to be a success. All right. Talk to me about timing. Oh, timing is everything. And you learned that in acting. Yes. Oh, yes. It's, uh, uh, I have survived through several uh, recessions. I think the one advantage that I had was as an actor for 22 years, I had periods when I had nothing on my slate. I had an opportunity to look around and think about things and to not get panicky when there was really nothing happening. Mm -hmm. It also gave me the ability to kind of open up to an opportunity. Right. For example, I was uh, one of those people in the 70s who took up tennis. Mm. I'd never had an opportunity to play nor had the time and so that led to my wanting to build a tennis club, a clay court tennis club. Mm -hmm. I, look, I looked for a place to put that clay court. Couldn't find it where I had thought I might in Santa Barbara. Went down to the waterfront and ended up with 32 and a half acres of the waterfront. But, yeah. but the city wanted not a tennis court. They wanted a, a um, hotel there with uh, uh, facilities uh, so that groups could come and, mm -hmm. and uh, so we developed a conference uh, center and resort. And that was not in my mind when I... Has your philosophy partly been to be open to opportunity? Absolutely. And, and to try to realize that, you know, you, you have to let everybody find their place. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think is really nice here, we have a lot of nice young people some have great experience already, and what we're trying to do is to let everyone compartmentalize and do what's best, what they can contribute, and give them responsibility to do that. How long did it take you from when you said, we're going to have a winery, to when you sold your first bottle? How many years? Uh, it was one year. We, we bottled, yes, 89. We, we didn't have a vineyard that was producing, so we bought fruit from our neighbors. And we made uh, three or four thousand cases, mm -hmm. and then we went out on the road to sell those uh, wines, and of course that was a major learning experience because there we were, with if I could say this, a sort of a household name, with a product that right. didn't measure up to many people's expectations. Mm -hmm. We found out that we were really, I don't want to say this, but it felt like we were over our heads because. Uh, we began to realize the complexity of the wine business. But you have to start somewhere, you have to learn, and what you do is you, you pack your suitcase and you go to the place, to the restaurant, <clears throat> and who has 800 wineries offering them mm -hmm. a tradition in many instances. Right. So uh, you just start. Bess and Eli spend time traveling the country to stay in touch with customers. We are a small producer. Uh, you know, we make a relatively small amount of product compared to some of our neighbors to the north. Mm -hmm. And I think really what gives us the ability and what allows us to, to be successful in the marketplace is that personal interaction with the uh, distributor, the retailer or restaurant account, and ultimately the consumer. Mm -hmm. So I spend a considerable amount of time out on the road shaking hands and talking about Santa Barbara County, which is a great, great place to grow the fruit and make the wine, and mm -hmm. um, it's what it's all about. We want to know, how do you make wine? Well, you know, quite candidly, it all starts in the vineyard. Um, I'd be, uh, I think, frankly lying to you if I told you that you know the winemaker really has a hundred percent of the responsibility what's what's grown in the vineyard the quality of the fruit that's produced is really key and in, in first and foremost but uh, you know from uh, winemaking standpoint there are a number of different decisions stylistic considerations um, evaluating the market and sort of where the trends are going and uh, 
Um, it takes a little bit of time to figure all that out, but uh, how do you become a winemaker? I think trial and error and a lot of hands-on experience and hey, it's not so bad. You get to drink a lot of great wine and have fun. <laughs> In 1996, the Syrah was named by the Boston Globe one of the best five Syrahs in the world. Fess Parker World Class Wine comes from California's Fox and Canyon Trail near Santa Barbara. It's 300 miles south of California's more established Napa and Sonoma vineyards. I have been in business now, other than the acting side, uh, for close to 40 years. And I'm local. And, uh, and we have tried to do the quality that, that we've talked about. Now what I'm finding is that there's an acceptance of, of the expectation of quality. Well, we alluded to the, the grocery store viability of Fess Parker as a name. You didn't want that. I didn't want that, but we found out along the way that that's the way the big distributor was disposing of our product. Hmm. They could sell it to the grocery store once we, once we sold it to them. Mm -hmm. We lost total control. Mm. So they could take a truckload right from the warehouse and go right to a large uh, grocery chain and put it out there and we couldn't do nothing about it. Eventually we figured out that we needed to be with a distributor who concentrated on on-premise or restaurants mm -hmm. and Or the shops. fine shops. The fine shops. Now you just hit on something here. If you priced your wine the way you want to price it, and that distributor sells it at a warehouse discount. As long as you're getting your margin, why do you care? Because this is a long-term business. We're just, you know, I think in some businesses you could say this is our first year, our second year, our third year. Mm -hmm. But I think this is a business of decades. And we're about to complete our first decade. And we're thinking not now, but 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line because this Parker family will soon have 11 grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And we hope that some of them will find this a fascinating enterprise and will keep it going. What we really want to be is in fine dining circumstances. How long did it take you to get to that conclusion that where we belong is the fine restaurant? I think that's a, that is such a niche. Don't you think that's a real thin, fine, finely carved niche, the well, restaurant business? It is. Uh, but if you can present your wine and it becomes a, a staple on their wine list, then while it is, it's not a huge sale, but it, it is a, a sale that builds. Continuous. But if, if you find the wine and you like it at this restaurant, the customer goes to another restaurant, it's not there. Do you have Fess Parker wine? Okay. Well, no, but we can get it. So we, yeah. it, it is okay. exponential. Okay, so you feel you have greater growth opportunity and continuity opportunity. Exactly. That's what you're after. You're yes. after the continuity. You have to be able to go out into the marketplace mm -hmm. or create an organization that can go out in the marketplace mm -hmm. and tell your story successfully. Mm -hmm. And that was, an, that was kind of interesting to me, having been an actor. Mm -hmm. You know, you cannot do a film without a story. Right. I mean, that's everything. Script. I never really would have believed when I started this that to sell a bottle of wine, you had to have a story. So tell me your story. Tell me what you would say to the, the five-star restaurant <laughs> chef. Well, um, our story was that uh, we were in an emerging region that could produce world-class wines, and that, that our quality was our goal. And then as we struggled along, we got to a point in about uh, the fourth or fifth year where um, the uh, stewardship or the mentor relationship with my son culminated in uh, a 1992 Syrah, which we brought out in 94, and it became a wine that was uh, comparable, uh, w would not have been uncomfortable in world-class uh, competition. Mm -hmm. And, and we started to build on the realization, yes, the, the, the story that we were telling everyone, because there were people here already telling the marketplace that this was a great place mm -hmm. with great potential. And part of the story, too, I suppose, was that um, we used the coonskin cap and 
uh, the be sure you're right then go ahead sort of approach and we, we took every it's kind of a cute thing mm -hmm. my son and daughter did not want me to put fess on the label they wanted we for the first two or three years we were Parker mm -hmm. and I think one day we were standing in front of a booth at a wine uh, festival and my son and daughter were pouring wine and I was standing out in front talking to some people and people that were knowledgeable and who should have known better they were local and they looked at me and they said do you have anything to do with this pointing to the Parker sign <laughs> <laughs> so you I'm, said guess what guys yeah it's and I finally persuaded my children to make it Fest Parker because it was an advantage for us so what's the secret to a good story I think the people, uh, the the, uh, the way you present yourself and your product, I think there's a certain um, part of your talking with someone that has to come from your conviction that you're right, you're saying something that is true, and that you're trying to share this with them and open their experience. <laughs> Here's what I learned from Fess Parker. Just as with a great film or a great television series, you need a great story. You write the script. It must paint the picture so people can see how you do what you do. And it should be so compelling that people can't resist buying from you. And here's a tip. Shorter is better than longer. At smallbusinessschool.org, there is self-help study for people who want to start a business and for those who want to grow the business they have. To learn more about this episode, choose the overview. You can read every word you're hearing today when you choose the transcript and go deeper with the case study. There's streaming video and access to interactive study guides throughout the site. Sales come through wholesaling to distributors, and retail sales come from the Winery Visitor Center, the Wine Club, and the Catalog. Charlie Kears is General Manager of the Winery. We have several retail divisions. We're standing in one right now, which is our retail center. This is our, our guest center and retail shop. We taste wine here, and we, we have many wine-related products. What would you like people to know about this place? The Fess Parker family commitment to quality. I, I think a lot of businesses will profess quality and customer service and customer care. And here it's not, it's not a matter of we talk about it. Here it's expected. Why did you jump on the web so early? Because you've had a website a long time. You've been selling wine on the web a long time. Why, why did you do that so fast? I found it to be probably the most exciting, mm -hmm. cost-effective, greatest thing there ever was for marketing. Okay. We could tell the story of the family, the winery, what we did, how we did it, and how proud we were to do it, all in just a few minutes, and it didn't cost us anything to do that. What can you teach people that are watching this who haven't done a web page yet? Um, telling the story correctly, and always emphasizing the quality, and not trying to elongate the tale make it too long. Okay, fewer words then. Fewer words, more graphics. Right. We have Fess Parker, which means we have Davy Crockett, we have Daniel Boone. But even more so, we have a wonderfully beautiful property mm -hmm. to work with and uh, a great product. And we had all, all this beautiful graphic material that we could put on the page to attract attention to it. How often do you update? Almost daily. You didn't have to hire anybody? No, we didn't. And you just did it yourself? It was a matter of reading the tutorial, having a little bit of help from a friend, and doing it myself. Cindy Simpson is the Marketing and Special Events Coordinator. She says the Visitor Center and its grounds are available for special events with the food being catered by the Fest Parker Inn, and of course, the wine is easy to find. Cindy, tell me about the wine club, how it got started, how you built your list, and what you offer. Basically, the wine club started with guests coming into the tasting room, and we would ask them if, we wanted, if they wanted to join the wine club. Um, they would receive two bottles of wine each quarter. Um, 
Along with the wine, they would also receive our newsletter, which gives them a list of upcoming special events at the winery. And the wines that they would receive in their shipments are all pre-release wines, so the rest of the general public wouldn't have a chance to get their hands on it before the wine club members. So one of the secrets to getting a club going is making sure that you offer something really unique. I if think you're so. in the club, you get this. You're in the club. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy explains that four color photography gets a much better response than do drawings. I mean, ask yourself if you would respond to this. It's very hard to sell a product that somebody can't see. Okay. Like the coonskin toppers or... Okay, when you say coonskin topper, uh, this is a whole new thing for me because I didn't know there was such a thing until I came here today. Only at Fest Parker Winery, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope so. <laughs> you guys could sue anybody else. And so this is the, uh, the coonskin topper. That's right in sketch right and you're saying you hardly sold any of those until you put it in you couldn't it looks like a wig i mean you couldn't really <laughs> tell what it, what it was and it sort of is a wig but it's a wig for a bottle i want you to talk to me about great people that you've been close to and what you learned from them walt disney uh, was certainly be at the top of my list uh, as a human being and as a creator, and uh, it was interesting looking back on this event of 40 years ago when I was under a personal contract to him. His dedication to the quality of whatever he was trying to do, I think sort of uh, became something that I have uh, appropriated for mm -hmm, myself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and hopefully for the family. And that, that was that he always wanted to do it as, as well as he could. And he was open. I remember when we were filming uh, the Davy Croc Crockett episodes, they were not terribly important to him because they were fulfilling a financial obligation to a business partner. ABC was the third network. And they were not doing well. And they came to Walt Disney, who, was, who needed money to open Disneyland said, if you will do a television program for us, we'll loan you the money and become a partner, and you can take us, take us out later. And he needed the money, didn't he? He needed the money. Because he was always spending more than he had. Absolutely. <laughs> you don't do that, though. Ab absolutely, I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I think if you're going to be you know, a, an entrepreneur, you, you can't worry about the money. I mean, this man was thinking openly. Mm -hmm. So that was a great lesson for me. And he was that way in person. I, as, as an employee, I could go up and ask his secretary if I could speak to him. Mm -hmm. Usually, I went in, and if he had people there, he'd said, have a seat, and I'll talk with you in a little bit. So mm -hmm. I'd sit and listen to business that I didn't understand, but... It was rubbing off. Yeah. I, I really believe uh, the way life is, is that we're only guaranteed the day. And yesterday, we can't do anything about it. And uh, I feel like that the 40 years uh, I've, that I've been trying to do business has been a learning experience. I'm anxious to apply it somewhere else. I'm anxious to see another project change from less than successful to successful. It's fun. But work is a good thing to you. Absolutely. Yeah. It was not my goal to work. <laughs> you know, driving up here from Santa Barbara to the winery this morning, um, I guess I was in my thoughts, and, and my wife said, well, why don't you lighten up? And I said, well, I'm doing what I like to do. I'm thinking about things that I want to do. Right. I'm not working. I'm just having a good time. Do you think that's what keeps you younger, happier, more fulfilled, having, uh, having something to go do? Absolutely. And, and you know, it's, a, it's the quality of the people. You know, I work with a lot of young people. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I find that uh, fun, you know, and I can see kind of where they are at their time of life and can go back and kind of relate a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, I think most of the time, I forget that I'm maybe two or three times older than they are because mm -hmm. we're both working on a project right. together. Right. So you feel as young as they are. I do.
can't forget Fess Parker's advice. Every great business has a great story. Find your story and tell it. We'll be back next week. Small Business School is made possible by support from the United States Postal Service, delivering the promise to America's 23 million small and growing businesses. There's no wait at the post office in your own office. USPS.com is waiting for you. And by Microsoft. We see you building a new company from an old company. We see a business full of potential. We are inspired to create software that helps you reach it. If you want to learn more about starting, running, and growing a business, come to our website, smallbusinessschool.org. There are streaming video and interactive study guides. The only way we can compete with big business is to be faster, smarter, and better. We are the engine of the American economy. We create the jobs. Small business is about big commitment. It's about sacrifice and struggle. But we do it because we say, if I don't do this, my life won't be complete.